everybody. Thank you for being on here with us on such a beautiful day. We really appreciate your time. I'm Katie Earl with the Erie County Department of Senior Services, and we're here with our instructor, Sue Staklosa. Welcome, Sue. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. It's great that we can be virtual and, and people are still taking advantage of this. So wonderful. A quick shout out to our sponsors, my Department of Senior Services, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Celsius Orthopedics and Wegmans for everything they do to make this program possible. If you're looking to get involved in the community for services, benefits, if you're a caregiver, call us at Senior Services. We'll help you however we can. We're at 858-8526. Quick housekeeping because we do have quite a new, uh, quite a few new folks on with us today. I am recording this session. I will try to post it on our website in the coming days. We are using our chat feature. So if you have any questions or comments for Sue as she's given her presentation, feel free to put those in the chat. If you're on a computer, look at the lower right hand side of your screen. You'll see that little fun chat bubble. Or if you're on a laptop or excuse me, a tablet or smartphone, touch your screen. That will bring up your control panel. And there you should see a circle with three dots and then your chat. So we hope you participate with us today. I will introduce the star of our show. Sue is a nurse practitioner with 13 years experience in a pulmonary and critical care practice. In this practice, she managed and educated obstructive sleep apnea patients, which she gave a class on for us a little while ago. She recently lectured on OSA at the New York State Nurse Practitioner Conference. She currently teaches the next generation of nurse practitioners at Damon College, and Sue is also a basic life support and advanced life support instructor, and she's talking about this today. So thank you, Sue. I'll turn it over. Oh, great to be here. Great to be here on this, uh, again, beautiful day, and I really appreciate uh, everyone taking their time on this uh, lovely day. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, your lipid numbers and what they mean, uh, what lipids do in the body, um, what are good lipids, bad lipids, how your doctor figures out where you need to be treated or not treated, and then some of the treatments for it. We've all, if you're over 30, we've all had our um, uh, lipid profiles drawn, and um, ho hopefully most of the time the doctor just says to you or the nurse practitioner, oh, they're fine. So I know you want to know what that exactly means and what you can do about it. Um, so first, first of all, first of all, I think I have the wrong PowerPoint up. So forgive me. Let me take a minute to switch one, switch them. So sorry. That's okay. Here, I'll take away. Your okay. sharing abilities, then I'll give it back yeah, to you. Yeah, we can, we can um, I can talk a little bit till I get my PowerPoint up. Um, Cause I do it for. Let's see this. Is still wrong. Hmm. Sorry. So, most of you, like I said, have had uh, lipid profiles done and um, and you wonder what they mean and what you can do and whether it's safe to be on um, these drugs. Sorry, I have it up on my other computer. This 
the, the I'm just looking the lipids presentation that you had sent me kind of looks similar to what you had up. It's similar, but it's this isn't. This isn't the one that's popping up and I don't know why I had it up earlier. So sorry. Um, okay. Let me check this one more time. I actually have 2 computers up because I've been having a little trouble with this 1. Um, you know, the beauty of technology. <laughs> um, sometimes it's wonderful and sometimes not so much. And today it's been. A little. Um, difficult. You just let me know if you want to share the one you sent me because I have that pulled up. Okay, that that we may have to do. I didn't. Um... Okay. Oh, here we are. You got okay. it. Okay. I got it. So let's start from the top. And I'll go back to share. Right. And hit yep. the new one. I hope this is the new one. Should be. We'll find out. Okay. All right. Sorry, everyone. Um, so back to the start. So why do we have the, if they cause so much trouble for us, why do we have cholesterol and these fats or lipids? Um, and cholesterol is a type of lipid or fat in our bodies because they do, um, a lot of things for us. They're found in all the body cells. All of our cells have a cell membrane that keeps all the stuff inside the cell um, so it doesn't burst out. And that's all made of lipids and fats. Um, there's our brain cells are uh, coated with fat. Um, we need uh, fat for stored energy. Um, when we use up the carbohydrates, then we start uh, using our fats. Um, generally, if your body is working right, and we'll talk about some of the risk factors, your body makes as much cholesterol as it needs. Um, and you'll be in equilibrium. It won't be too high or too low. The cholesterol in your blood, the cholesterol your body makes is made in the liver. It is important in making a lot of different hormones also, um, adrenaline, um, uh, testosterone. Um, you have to have the cholesterol in those hormones. And it also aids in digesting your fats. So you need these lipids in the cholesterol to help you digest fats. So that's your body makes a certain amount of cholesterol um, in response to what you're eating and, and what it perceives that you need. Then we also take in this is where a lot of times our problem is, including myself, is the dietary cholesterol. And most of our dietary cholesterol comes from animal foods, animal fats that we, that we eat. So what's in a lipid profile? So you get your blood drawn, they send it away, you get these numbers. So there's actually um, four different things that you get on a lipid profile. Number one is your total cholesterol. So that will usually be the top number. Number two is called high density uh, lipoprotein, and we'll talk a little bit more about each one of them. You also then get the low density lipid profile, uh, lipid protein. So your total cholesterol is made up of those two numbers combined. And then it'll also give you triglycerides, which is a, another type of fat that is used in the body, but that's tied more to your carbohydrates that you take in. So you have your HDL, your high density lipoprotein, your LDL, the low density lipoprotein. Sometimes you'll get on there if it's a very sophisticated uh, lipid profile, the VLDL, that's very low density lipoprotein. So that's even the worst cholesterol. And again, your total cholesterol is the HDL and the LDL combined. The triglycerides, you'll get the number. As of now, the screening is recommended to start at 20 years old. Um, it used to be 30. I think most of the time we're, we're starting at 30, but you can, the doctors can start screening at 20 and repeat every five years if it's normal. Um, if it's not normal, you may get it done yearly. If you're starting medication, that also will change how often they'll do the lipid profiles. So let's talk about HDL or what I call the happy cholesterol. That's the good cholesterol. And the way I remember it is H is happy and the more you have, the happier your body is. 
So what the HDL does for us, it helps, it's a, it's, the body always tries to be in equilibrium to have what it needs, but not too much. So the HDL helps remove the excess cholesterol from the body. So it has a protective effect against heart disease, um, stroke, because it helps get rid of that extra cholesterol. The number we like to see is greater than 40. Um, the higher, the better though, and greater than 70 is really wonderful. And one of the studies I looked at every 10 milligram increase, increase. So you go from a number, an HDL of 40 to an HDL of 50, you'll have a 50% decrease in your coronary artery disease risk. And the coronary artery disease is the plaque in the arteries that then causes the heart attacks. Um, and the picture on the right is kind of showing you how you have the, the, uh, the cholesterol and, and um, uh, the stuff going into the, uh, this is a plaque here, going into the artery and how the HDL then returns it to the liver. And then the liver metabolizes it and secretes more cholesterol as, it, as, it, as needed. So now LDL or bad cholesterol or some lousy cholesterol. This is the cholesterol that increases your risk of heart disease and atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a fancy term for these plaque buildups and narrowing of the arteries, which can happen anywhere in the body. Um, our biggest concern with this is, of course, the heart um, and the brain. Um, it combines with these inflammatory substances to make plaques. And what you mean by that is that when your body has a system, when it's under um, uh, stress or there's injury, uh, like say within the artery, it, it sends all these inflammatory cells to that area, um, which then also enters into this plaque. So when you see this, this artery, there's three different walls of the artery. Here's the blood flow. And then here is the plaque. And it can be a hard plaque or a soft plaque. The newer, if it's newer, it's it's softer, and then it gets it's harder. But you can see how the blood flow is very diminished here. So, uh, let's say we'll talk about you know with heart disease. So you have diminished blood flow, and you decide to do some activity. You're going to go out and mow the lawn, and now you need more blood to your heart because you're exercising. Well you can't increase it as much as you should because the flow is is decreased and then maybe you get chest pain. So this air is filled with uh, debris and lipids, the cholesterol, uh, and pretty much the LDL cholesterol. So we're gonna talk about uh, the, the goals, but the LDL goal range, it used to be, I don't know, I wanna say five years ago or more, it used to be that everybody had the same number. Uh, you want it to try to stay below 120, um, and if, if some doctors in, wanted you below 100. There's new guidelines on um, what your goal LDL should be on your lipid profile based on your risk factors, which makes more sense. So we don't, you know, put Katie, who's young and healthy, on a, on a statin because her lipids her, you know, her LDL is 125, um, but maybe you put me on it. Um, and then you look, you have to look at what the HDL. So um, it's gotten more complicated. And I think for um, uh, us in the, in the public, it's gotten more complicated because you wonder, well, why is this guy, they're treating him with a statin, but my numbers are about the same and why aren't I on something? Well, we'll, we'll talk more about that because I hear just the basic goal ranges here. So optimally, um, especially heart doctors, cardiologists would love to see the LDL less than 100. Near optimal 100 to 129, high is above 130. And then, you know, really above 160 is considered pretty high and above 190 really high. Um, so when we look at 
the lipid pro the LDLs. These are the things that affect what the goal, your LDL goal is going to be. So if you have diabetes, basically diabetes is, when they look at a risk factor, has the same weight as if you already have coronary artery disease. So diabetes is going, because it's an inflant, you know, there's a lot of inflammation with diabetes. It's going to give you a higher number and probably starting on medication or uh, whatever the doctor decides to do sooner because of the diabetes. Other things that affect where your goal is and where whether you're going to be treated or not is inflammatory conditions. Because again, we're talking about this big inflammatory process in the arteries that then also uses those those LDLs, those those kind of lipids to uh, make the plaque. So uh, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. Again, when you have those co those comorbidities, you may they may want your LDL to be lower than um, 120. A thing called metabolic syndrome, and this is um, what a lot of Americans have. And there's different um, components to metabolic syndrome. And if you have any of these three that you see here, so increased waist, waist circumference, so you carry your fat um, in, in your belly. Um, that gives you a higher risk of, of heart disease. Your triglycerides are greater than 150. So you have a lot of, um, you're probably eating a lot of carbs and a lot of baked goods, you know, guilty. Um, blood pressure is high, blood sugar is high, but your HDL, the good cholesterol is low and you may have chronic kidney disease. So if you have any of these three, you have metabolic syndrome, which again, the do, you know, the doctors and the practitioners may want to push that LDL down below 100. Want to talk a little bit about primary and secondary prevention. Um, if maybe you've heard some about this in the news lately with aspirin. And uh, they talk about primary and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is before you have any diagnosed heart disease. So um, you're, you're, LDL may be elevated. You may have some of the um, uh, risk factors uh, in the me metabolic syndrome. Um, and we, I, I hopefully I can, hopefully I'm not having a lot of good computer experience today, but hopefully I can show you there's a, there's a, a, a risk factor thing. We just put numbers in and it tells you what you need to do for the uh, treating the cholesterol. So, you may have what they call dyslipidemia or problems with lipids and that's being treated, but you don't have diagnosed heart disease. You've never had a heart, heart attack before. Uh, you don't, you know, have coronary artery disease. Secondary prevention is when you've had a heart attack, you have coronary artery disease, and that's a whole different ball game. If you've had heart disease and you're following with a cardiologist and it's secondary prevention, they're trying to prevent a second event. Uh, or a third event or whatever, uh, you're gonna, they're gonna want your, your LDLs to be lower, uh, 100 or even most cardiologists really like to push it down below 70. But that's a group that, that is already has heart problems. We're talking about uh, primary prevention and what we do to treat the, the cholesterols or not treat, treat it and what, how we get the numbers. And the reason I bring up aspirin is they had talked about the um, the aspirin for primary prevention. And I don't know if they made that clear in, on the news, um, but they really didn't find any benefit, uh, you know, studying things for several years with giving people who don't have heart disease aspirin every day to prevent heart disease. People who have heart disease, that's again, another story, and they may need still need a daily aspirin but not uh, the, for prevention. Okay, so there's a couple other components to the lipid profile. Uh, the VLDL, um, that's the very uh, uh, low density. So the smaller the particles of the lipids, the easier it is to get in, get in and make those plaques. So it increases the risk of plaque formation. 
it's more associated again with the triglycerides and triglycerides are more associated with carbohydrates and then in actually diabetes. The goal is to keep those under 30. Now, not all lipid profiles that you'll get drawn will have that on there also, but some, some will. So triglycerides, um, there's, uh, those are extra calories. Uh, they are converted, so we take in extra calories. Uh, and it's, uh, you eat baked goods, you eat some bread, it's extra calories, it's converted into the triglycerides and stored for energy. So, you know, it has a purpose. It's just sometimes we, we go over the mark. Um, they can be released as energy is needed. And the goal is less than 150. So when we talk about that big term dyslipidemia, it's abnormal le levels of circulating total cholesterol. So if you get your printout from your doctor's office when you go in and they have the you know, summary of the day of your visit and they'll have different diagnosis, they might have dyslipidemia. And that means abnormal levels of your cholesterol. Or it might even say hyperlipidemia, which means high cholesterol. You know, we have to, you know. My son always used to say to me, why do you have to have like a whole different language? Why can't you just call it what it is? But well, we do. So what is dys dyslipidemia? Basically a high LDL, so a high bad cholesterol and a low HDL or a low happy cholesterol. And, and or you can have this with it, high triglycerides. That is, an, again, an important risk factor for coronary artery disease and stroke. And there's just tons of studies that have been replicated that it's pretty uh, taken as the fact that it does uh, increase your risk for um, heart attack and stroke. So what are some risk factors? And there are modifiable risk factors, which means things we can change, and non-modifiable risk factors, which means things we can't change. So like non-modifiable is our age. So as we get older, we have usually have a little more trouble with cholesterol. Maybe our liver, you know, our livers aren't as efficient as they were when we were younger. So if you're over 45 for men or over 55 for women, there's some, uh, that's a non-modifiable risk factor. Women is a little bit older because estrogen in women is protective um, against the high cholesterols. Unfortunately, for, for the women listening, when you do go through menopause, you can have a big spike in your um, total cholesterol and your HDL or your LDL and your HDL might go down because of the uh, decreased estrogen. Um, so you may be fine uh, with that protective effect and then uh, have your first lipid profile done, you know, postmenopausal and your lipids are are elevated, and that's the reason why. Gender, men have more um, issues with it than women. Heredity and genetics, sometimes we just can't get by, um, you know, uh, the genes we're born with that don't um, clear the cholesterol as well or make too much cholesterol. Um, if you have a family history of coronary artery disease, heart attacks, in a first degree relative. So a first degree relative is mom, dad, siblings, uh, your kids. Um, if they had heart disease younger than 55, that's a risk factor for you. It probably, if they had heart disease younger than 55, you know, if they've had a heart attack at a young age, unless they really are doing some bad lifestyle things, it's probably they also have a genetic issue too that they, um, have trouble clearing the cholesterol. So what are some of the modifiable things you can do? Well, if you're smoking, don't smoke. Um, it increases the um, LDL cholesterol. It also makes um, the platelets and all these other little cells stickier. The nicotine makes them stickier so they clump together. So you can see if you have sticky cells going through a narrowed artery, that's how you can get a complete blockage. When you get a complete blockage, no blood goes to a part of the heart, that's a heart attack. That's a, uh, well, our fancy term, myocardial infarction. Again, type two diabetes, you not necessarily can't modify that you have it, but the best, better control you keep of it um, 
the, the better your um, lipid profiles will be. Weight loss, um, our diet, our typical American diet does lend itself to having higher cholesterols. Um, lack of exercise, um, you know, the more, the more you can move, the better. Um, and that actually exercise increases your HDL, your happy cholesterol. And excessive alcohol use. Um, you know, there's studies out with a glass of red wine a couple of days a week uh, may help uh, with heart disease. And, and, and that may be true, but um, excessive alcohol use will um, uh, increase your cholesterol because it, your liver can't work as well if it's too busy processing and uh, detoxifying the alcohol. Now, this is where we're going to try to get on the internet. And uh, if not, we can talk about something else. We can do something else, but I can talk about it. So this is called the um, uh, arterio arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk calculator. So this is, you plug in some numbers, you get what they call your 10-year risk for getting or having, having heart disease. And then from there, it will give you a recommendation, give the doctors and uh, MPs a recommendation on if you should be started on some medicine or not. So we're going to see if this works today. Maybe it will. It's just dark. Okay, and you can pull this up yourself. I have, you know, I have the um, the link there. There's no big well, mystery. What? I'm sorry, we're not seeing it. We're just seeing your PowerPoint. So what yeah. I can do is put the link in the chat. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Oh, that's too bad. Well, let me just talk about um, what's on here, and how we get this. So the um, so first it asks for your age and I'm just pulling it up on my phone so I can give you some numbers. Um, and again, you can pull this up at home and get your 10, your, uh, your, um, your risk. So I'm going to put my numbers in and we'll see what happens and then we'll put some others. So current age. To say it's 62. They ask for your sex, female, your race, because there's different, there is, um, um, tends to be higher cholesterols and problems in the um, African American community. They ask for your blood pressure. So uh, your systolic, I'm going to put 130, and your, my diastolic was about 80. My total cholesterol, my last one was 205. My happy cholesterol or HDL was 55. My LDL was one, oops. Was 120. Okay, I and then, I so it was 120. Then they ask you if you have history of diabetes, no. They ask if you're a smoker, no. And if you're a former smoker, it'll ask you when you quit. Um, are you on medicine for your blood pressure? Yes. Uh, on a statin? Yes. On aspirin? No. Um, so my current 10 year risk is 5.7%. So I have a 5.7% risk of getting heart disease within 10 years. So they don't. necessarily recommend a statin with that. Now, just to tell you, because you can pull stuff up on there, that is not the be all, the end all, um, because your provider has to take into consideration other things that are wrong. So that basically what this is looking at as far as risk factors is just smoking, diabetes, and high blood pressure. And then your non, you know, your age, and your sex to give you 
some type of number to work with. Now, if you have other things, like I have rheumatoid arthritis and have high inflammatory markers, so they're going to start me on a statin because of the risk for that. So you may have other um, comorbidities that will factor into the decisions of where your cholesterol should be. So my cardiologist wants my LDL, my bad cholesterol, less than 55 because of that. Even though on this risk calculator, I don't look too bad. So um, if we changed, we left the same cholesterol numbers, but I put, let's say, 72 for an age, changed it to male, uh, we'll still say no diabetes, and we'll say not on a statin, not on treatment for cholesterol, just down for your blood pressure, then your risk, so we really didn't change much but your sex, um, that you weren't on medication for your um, cholesterol and your age, your risk goes up to 23.7%. So that's a 10-year risk of having heart disease, goes up to 23.7%. So then they would decide that actually the recommends that you be started on a statin um, to bring that risk down. Sorry, I couldn't pull it up and show it to you, but the link's there and uh, you can play with it and put it up there the next time you get a uh, your lipid profile done. But that's one of the tools that we use when we're trying to decide to um, treat someone's uh, cholesterol or not. It's not, uh, again, one size fits all, and if your number is this, you automatically uh, get treated. So this is just, again, some pictures of how um, this atherosclerosis happens, and again, the, the uh, biggest impact, um, heart and the brain, but this happens in all the blood vessels. So you can have bad circulation in your legs because you have um, plaque in your legs. Um, so it just over here with the cholesterol, it shows the normal artery. Um, it shows how we're starting here on phase two to get a couple little plaques here. Uh, none of us get to a certain age without having some some small some amount of plaque formation in our arteries. Phase three, we're getting a little bit more. The flow is still okay. Um, and then phase four, you have really, really narrowed flow. Um, and you're usually, you know, obviously at this part point, you're having symptoms a lot of times, maybe chest pain and things like that, because you can't get enough blood flow through those arteries that supply the oxygen to the heart. It's, um, the heart needs the oxygen just like the rest of the body, and it actually needs it more so, especially if we're out mowing the lawn. So the coronaries send that blood and that oxygen into the muscle of the heart, and you can, you know, see here that this isn't going to work for long because uh, we're not getting good blood flow. And then there's another, you know, picture of how the the plaque the plaque uh, works there. Okay, so let's say you had your lipid profile done. You don't have heart disease uh, yet. Um, your your uh, ten year risk profile is borderline. So your provider says, well, let's try uh, what we would lifestyle modification and see, um, try that for a few months and we'll repeat the lipid profile and see if it's better. So, you know, first of all, which we all think of is diet. So um, we want to uh, decrease um, our LDL with that. Um, it doesn't, uh, hate to uh, be, um, uh, um, negative about it, but it doesn't decrease it by much. Um, if you have a really high cholesterol, I mean, what are we talking? You know, 10, 20% decrease if you're really behaving yourself. But if you're borderline and you do all these things, it can really help. The other thing, if indeed you need drug treatment, we you always still want to do the lifestyle modification. So what is that? low saturated fats. Um, so that's, you know, animal meats, 
um, and uh, especially the uh, avoid polyunsaturated fats, all that highly processed things. Um, uh, fast food has is worse than maybe a, a nice smaller piece of lean steak. Um, and uh, you need some healthy fats. Again, the body does need fats. We need carbohydrates, we need proteins, and we need fats, but we need them in reasonable quantities. So like healthy fats, um, um, uh, fatty fish, salmon, tuna, um, avocados, not a big fan, but I, I do love uh, salmon and tuna. Um, olive oil, instead of using, you know, the more highly processed oils to cook in, um, can make a huge difference. And then also less carbohydrates, because that drives that whole triglycerides and the low, very low um, LDLs um, particles. Um, so less breads, less baked goods. Um, than we generally um, eat fast food. Uh, weight loss um, is uh, be very helpful for a lot of things, for the high blood pressure, for the cholesterol, um, for, you know, just the general functioning. If you can't increase exercise and activity, and, you know, when we say these things, you know, we think, oh, you know, I can't, you know, I'm not going to go out and w walk five miles, or I can't do that. Any increase in the activity is going to be helpful. Um, you don't have to go out and run, you know, a marathon, uh, walk a little bit, walk around the house, maybe get up and even just, you know, take a few walks around the house. Um, what you can, what you can do, um, increase it. If you're smoking, stop smoking. Um, it, it hurts a lot of things, but, uh, in this context, it really does increase, uh, your cholesterol and increase your risk of having a heart attack because of those clumpy cells. If you're a diabetic, keep your blood sugars under good control. The better your blood sugars are controlled and the better your, if you have high blood pressure, the better your blood pressures are controlled, the easier it's going to be to uh, get those cholesterols down that whole, like I said, that whole metabolic syndrome. So healthy diet, you know, try to, you know, cut the fats and the carbs down and healthy fats in your diet and healthy carbs. You need, car you know, again, you need those three basic food groups um, and I'm guilty. I, I love carbs. We just don't have to, I don't have to eat them like I do, <laughs> you know, um, weight loss, increase your activity, whatever your level is now, you increase it, increase it a bit, uh, no smoking and keep your blood sugar and your blood pressures under good control. That's your lifestyle modification. This is the stuff that is a hundred percent in your control. No one controls it, but you, um, you don't have to you know, um, rely on anybody else to do it for you. You're the owner of this. So let's say, again, you're borderline, you do all these things, generally sometimes for, depending on how bad your profile was, but four to six months, they'll repeat your lipid profile. So um, I love this cartoon. Um, I can't read it all, cause, but I um, I want you to load me up in, with statins I read about, so I can eat as many fatty burgers as I like without getting a heart attack. So, and that's our, you know, that's the way we think, right? That's the way I, you know, that's just a general way. If I can take the statins, then I can eat whatever I want. And again, my point of this uh, joke is, you still should be doing all the lifestyle modifications get your cholesterol down, maybe we even get, you know, the medication down. So, um, so when we start to talk about medications, again, add it to lifestyle modification. Statins are the first line of treatment. Um, and I know that there's, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about statins, there's a lot of talk about statins and, um, uh, whether they hurt or help, or so many people are on statins, there are, it's more, one of the most um, prescribed drugs um, in the country. Um, and a lot of it, again, has to do with um, more of a aging population, our American diet, um, that we have a lot of people with high cholesterols. And um, they have been shown to, um, help prevent heart disease. 
So, and they are generally for the amount of people that are on them, very well tolerated. And we'll talk a little more about that. They can decrease um, your cholesterol by 25 to 60%. So that's quite a, quite a, a decrease. Again, primary prevention, the studies have shown that it decreases your chance of heart attack, death, and that's cardiovascular disease events by 30%. And that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big number when we're looking at um, decreasing those kinds of um, problems, the heart attacks um, and death um, by 30%. Now, secondary prevention, which is, again, people who already have heart disease, it decreased coronary heart disease death by 40%. Again, huge number. You know, most of the time if we do studies, if we can decrease uh, um, death by 10%, it's huge. that's a big deal. Um, and all-cause mortality, that means they didn't necessarily die of a heart disease, but they died of something else by 30%. So we know that statins can do a good job in people that need to have their cholesterols brought down. So what does, uh, what does it do? It decreases the LDL cholesterol by slowing down the liver production of it and increasing the liver's ability to remove the cholesterol. So it slows down the production of the LDL and then it also helps the liver get rid of all that extra cholesterol. And as we talked about, a lot of the things like you know, say just just getting older, our livers don't don't work as well as they did when we were 20 years old. So it has a harder time removing all that extra cholesterol. So these drugs help that. And some of the names you may all be familiar with, atorvastatin, that's a generic now, so that's a that's prescribed a lot. Uh, lovastatin, simvastatin. Um, anything with a statin on the end of it is this type of drug. Again, generally well tolerated. Any medication, though, can cause side effects. Medication, you know, Tylenol, medication you buy over the counter. Um, the most common problem and that I've heard and that you can see in the uh, literature is muscle aches, muscle pain. And if that starts, you have to call, you know, who ordered it. And they may take you off of it. Sometimes it's just a tran transient problem. They may decrease the dose. But the most common thing is um, muscle aches. Any medication can cause an allergic reaction if it's the first time. Um, uh, nausea, those kind of things. Um, but that is the most the most common. Um, the other thing I wanted to say when I was talking about side effects is that even drugs you buy over the counter, um, uh, herbal supplements, vitamins, many of those can have interactions if you're on other medications. So um, not that I am against those, a lot of them are very, very helpful, but you need to um, just uh, talk to your provider and make sure there's no interactions. Nowadays, when we order something in the office and we order it on the computer, because that's how we do it now, if I order something and you're on, you know, I have your medications in and there's an interaction, a box pops up and says there's an interaction. But if you buy something over the counter, nothing's going to pop up and say there's an interaction. So just be mindful of that. A lot, like as an example, a lot of herbal supplements will react with blood thinners. So, you know, you just, you know, have to be aware of that. So, or anytime you're started on a new medication, if you have a problem, uh, it might not be listed as something common because your bo everybody's body's different. You know, just give your provider a call and see if that's related to the new medication. Um, but basically the, the most common thing I've seen, oops, now what the heck did I do, um, is, um, there we are. The most common thing I've seen is the muscle aches. And um, like I said, we either take them off or if we can, we knock it down. Um, so they don't, they don't have that. The other kind of medications that aren't used as often, bile acids, uh, what they do is they, you know, the, the bile is made in the um, um, 
gut, well, it's made in the liver, it's stored in the gallbladder, and it can um, neutralize the uh, the fats because that's what you know what the gallbladder secretes. Uh, it helps in fat digestion. Niacin um, that is um, pretty good when your triglycerides are very high. Um, I have to say a lot of times not tolerated very well. There's uh, flushing with it and headaches. Um, we've gotten around that with giving people, having people take um, aspirin before they take the niacin. Um, but if, you know, again, if I had my choice, most people are, are better uh, with the statins. And there was a few people who had very, that I took care of that had very high triglycerides, just very high triglycerides. And we um, tried to use the niacin. So, but that's the flushing is normal. The headaches are normal, but it's not. You know, a lot of people don't uh, like it. And the fibrates are just another class of um, uh, uh, drugs that take care of the LDL. Um, and sometimes, if people can't tolerate um, the statins, probably the next drugs they'd go to is the fibrates. And uh, that's a picture of Bryce Canyon. I thought uh, that would just be nice and relaxing. So I'm interested in taking any questions. Oh, well, Sue, thank you so much for that very clear presentation. You're welcome. We have... Oh, and that is a beautiful picture. Wow. I love it there. Okay, we've got a couple questions coming in here. So uh, bear with me while I try to read this one to you, please. So on my last cholesterol test results, so total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and LDL, it had a non-HDL cholesterol calculation. I have no idea what this is. So the non-HDL uh, calculation, it, it, they take the, uh, the HDL out, the high, the happy cholesterol, and they put together the LDL and the VLDL. So everything that's not HDL. So I don't know what kind of number you got there, but that's, okay. that's all the combined outside of the HDL. Uh -huh. That makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. Let's see, this one is, is plaque buildup reversible specifically exclusively through lifestyle change? Well, that's a fairly uh, hot topic and has been probably for the last 20 years. Um, there's some, um, oh, I can't remember his name. It's the first one who started that, but there's some evidence that aggressive uh, lifestyle change can reverse plaque formation in And aggressively meaning, um, as one of the cardiologists said to me, you know, eating, eating grass and shoots, um, you really, um, they, they had this study where they actually had the, pe the people were, uh, you know, monitored almost daily and uh, food was given to them. Um, so they ate the right things and then they exercised and it was meditation and they did, you know, the, the, where they put the dye into the the arteries and they did see there was some plaque reversal. Um, it generally though, in the general population outside of those kind of studies, um, especially if it's a hard plaque, it's not necessarily reversible, but it is, um, um, you can stop the progression, which is, um, a huge issue. So if you have some plaques that say are stage two or stage three, if you can stop the progression. And then also what happens is that, you know, you have your basic coronary arteries and the, the more you, um, you exercise and use, use your heart, the more you get these collateral arteries that also supply the heart. So that may go around the plaque. So you can have that happen where the collateral circulation, the circulation that's not uh, the main main circulation builds up. 
So long-winded ex explanation short, um, not a lot of great evidence for plaque reversal, uh, certainly a lot of good evidence for um, stabilization of the plaques. Um, and actually too, and I won't, the hard plaques, even though they stop the, they can stop, impede blood flow, they're actually safer than the soft plaques because the soft plaques can rupture and then they have, they close up the artery quickly and you get a heart attack. So, um, so good evidence for stabilization of the, of the plaques and not further progression. And that's what we we aim for. But you will see some really, really aggressive studies that have shown reversal, um, some reversal, but it's, uh, it's a hard, it's a hard life to live. Interesting. Okay. Thanks, Sue. You're welcome. This next one says, thank you for the very informative presentation. You shared a lot of helpful numbers, which I would like to reference. Would it be possible to obtain a copy of your presentation? So would you be able to share your slides with us or I can send them out? Sure. Perfect. So I can email those out to people and then I'll also email you the link um, to the recording once I post that. Thank you. Uh, this is well done, Sue. Very informative and much needed in our general population. I think that one's from my mother, by the way. So, you know, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny that. Um, this one is, is there anything in the literature about statins and muscle cramps? Yes, that's the muscle aches, the muscle cramps. Yes, you can get, you can get cramping instead of aching. Uh, Charlie horses in your um, calves. Yeah. And again, sometimes it's transient, like when you first start the medication, but if it's, it, you still should uh, touch base with um, who ordered the statin. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. This next one is, what percentage does hereditary play in cholesterol or heart disease? When my husband had a heart attack, doctor said cholesterol wasn't that high. It was from hereditary factor. Yes. Um, it can, well, heredity, heredity uh, can play a huge factor in these high cholesterols and dyslipidemia, but you also can have um, uh, other reasons for heart attacks that are genetic, like um, uh, spasm in the coronary arteries where they, they tighten up um, and close up. And um, for him, I don't know, but for some, some people, um, the what isn't a high cholesterol for the general population that doesn't have a genetic problem may be a high cholesterol for them. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. Uh, some of the cardiologists push it down to 70, uh, push it down to 55, um, you know, or anything, you know, generally the general population, if it's under 120, we're happy. So genetically, his body may not have been able to tolerate what what we would be able to tolerate as a, as a cholesterol too, and there could be other factors going into what happened to his heart other than cholesterol. That's the main reason, but the, for most people, but other things can be going on. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. You can throw a blood clot to the coronaries, too. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's not about to think it. too much about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think just enough. Um, Knowledge okay. isn't actually much <laughs> sometimes a nice thing, but go on. Okay. <laughs> um, this is a two part question, so I'll ask the first part. How long does it take for plaque to form? Well, um, that's not a simple question either. It takes a lifetime. We start forming plaques, you know, young, um, and it progresses. Um, that kind of slow progression um, many times is not as dangerous as you can have something happen quickly for, you know, many reasons. You know, your liver isn't doing what it's doing. You're taking new medication. Uh, some medications increase your cholesterols. Um, uh, you know, again, your cholesterol is good and then you're postmenopausal and, and you have a higher cholesterol. So there may be a quicker progression, but generally 
um, it's years. And I, I remember oh, it was a while ago reading a study. I think it was World War II guys. I, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But they did the study on um, uh, soldiers that had died. And they were young, you know, soldiers. And there was already some evidence of plaque formation in their coronary arteries. A small amount. We're talking 10, 20 percent. Um, and that's how they, they grade it. If they do what they call, you know, an angiogram and they put, shoot the dye through the coronaries, they, they grade how much, how big the plaque is by, you know, if you have a 90 percent, it's only got 10 percent blood flow through there. So even as young people, we have some plaque formation that is, you know, generally minor, but so a lifetime is the, is the, uh, with, with jumps, you know, with, you can have peaks with different situations. Okay. Thank you. Now, the second part to that question is how often do HDL and LDL numbers change? Well, they take a bit to change. So that's why, you know, we, we wouldn't start like lifestyle modifications or start a drug and then do the blood work in a week. They usually do it in four months. So, um, that's kind of the rule of thumb. If we're doing any changes, um, then uh, four months, four to six months. Um, if things are normal, um, you know, or a little borderline, maybe in a year, but um, if four to six months is about what we would repeat if we were changing something, it takes a bit, it takes a little bit to get down. Okay. Good to know. Thanks, Sue. I know we're coming up on time here. We've got a couple okay. more things. Is that okay with you? Yep, it's fine. Okay. So this is, is quite specific and individually tailored, um, but I'm wondering if the, your response may be able to shed some light on the rationale. So now I will read it. I'm in my 80s taking 10 milligrams of Lipitor. My cholesterol is 170. My HDL is 45. And my LDL is between 110 to 120. My doctor wants to increase the amount of Lipitor to 40 milligrams to get my LDL down some more. Is this a good recommendation? Well, I certainly wouldn't say yes or no to that because your doctor knows you, knows what your other health issues are. Um, so I suspect that there's something else um, he feels um, he needs to push you down more. Maybe your, um, you know, cardiovascular risk is higher. Uh, 10 milligrams is a very, is a very low dose of, um, Lipitor. Um, he probably, I would suspect wants to get your LDL down less than a hundred. Um, Is your L, your HDL is okay? It's not great, but um, if your LDL is one twenty, I suspect he wants to try to get you down below a hundred. Um, maybe again for the, the different risk factors. Um, so now that you know that, you can ask him. Well, what is you know what is what's my risk? Um, Forty milligrams is kind of the standard dose for Lipitor. We always try to use the lowest dose possible, um, but it isn't it isn't an outrageous dose either. So, and also we have to you know we, we've concentrating on the heart, but if there's other issues going on like stroke or or things like you know, um, he's concerned about something like that, he may want to push you down more too. Okay, thanks, Sue. A yeah. couple more things here. Uh, a compliment. Thank you. I learned a lot about cholesterol. So goal achieved. Welcome. You're welcome. Uh, this is what age group are these studies being done on? My my short answer is I don't know. Um, but a lot of the uh, recommendations are for people over uh, 55. Um, I, I, I know what you're asking. Are they being done on 80 year olds? 
um, and do 80 year olds or 90 year olds have more uh, side effects than a 50 year old. Um, I suspect they're being done kind of like most studies, middle age to early, you know, 55, 65, but I, I don't know. That's a good question. Yep, good question. Okay, this one. If you get muscle aches after being on statins for years, should you still tell the ordering physician? Uh, yes, um, I would. Um, you could have muscle aches for many different reasons than the statin, but let him, uh, you know, the two of you figure that out together. Um, things can change in your metabolism. Um, I don't know, different drugs added to it, uh, add, you, you've added to it. So even if you've been on a statin for a long time, it is possible that you can get that side effect. Generally, most people get it, you know, early on in the course or after uh, an increase in uh, the dose. But, um, you know, I would certainly run it by them. All right, great, thank you for that. Uh, we're winding down here, we've got a thank you. Uh, someone's wondering if the recording of the super class will be available. Yes, hoping to have that, uh, if not by tomorrow, early next week, you'll be able to find that on our website at erie.gov slash University Express. And this last question that I'm seeing is, have you heard of statin being subscribed for two or three days a week rather than daily? Yes. Um, again, we hopefully, um, I always try to use the least amount of drug that you have to. And if um, if it works for you, if it works for your lipid profile to be on two to three days a week, that's okay. Um, I I have had people that have have had that. You know, have had some issues with statins, um, and uh, if we go to an every other day, um, it's worked better for them. Um, I'm sure that you know they're following your lipid profiles, and if they're staying, you know, staying where they want them. Yeah, it's not usual, but I, I have seen that done. Yes, I've done it. Okay, thank you. Now I'm just seeing a bunch of thank yous pouring in. So oh, Sue, you're, you're wonderful. Welcome. Oh, thank you. This was great. I love doing it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you, and to everyone who's on, thank you. Yes, now, thank go you for enjoy. Giving. Yeah, thank you for spending your time with me on this beautiful day. <laughs> All right, well, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, thank you so very valuable. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, all right, everybody, I will send out that information when I have it, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.